who's made a difference in the world. He was a man with a dream. Johannes Gutenberg is the man who invented the printing press. He's responsible for the rapid spread of education, literacy, scripture, the Bible being printed on a press and being able to be rapidly produced and shared across the world. Johannes Gutenberg was a man with a dream who saw that dream come to fruition. The Gutenberg Press, as it was called, with its wooden and later metal movable type printing, brought down the price of printed materials and made such materials available for the masses. It remained the standard until the 20th century. He invented it in 1440. This man's dream was so big that it was still impacting the world centuries later. The Gutenberg printing press developed from the technology of the screw-type wine presses of the Rhine Valley. It was there in 1440 that Johannes, Johannes Gutenberg created his printing press, a hand press, in which ink was rolled over the surfaces of movable, hand-set block letters held within a wooden form, and the form was then pressed against a sheet of paper. A man with a dream who changed the world. Thomas Edison. Now, it's debated as to whether or not he really can be credited with the invention of the light bulb, but he was the first man to create the system, the working system within, within which the light, bur- light bulb worked. 1878, he began his research. He tested different materials for the bulb. He finally realized that a carbonized bamboo filament would last the longest, up to and well over 1,200 hours of light from this light bulb. He was a man with a dream to meet a need that saw it come to fruition. And then a name that I don't think I've ever heard before, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but this man, his research, his work, I guarantee you has impacted you today. Like within the last few hours, definitely. Somehow this man's work, Lawrence Roberts. Lawrence Roberts was the man who put together this intercommunication system between computers in the 1960s that eventually led to the invention of the internet. Now, don't tell this to Al Gore. He might get a little upset. But Lawrence Roberts is the guy behind the invention of the Internet. In the the 1960s, a team of computer scientists working for the U.S. Defense Department's ARPA, which stands for Advanced Research Projects Agency, built a communications network to connect the computers in the agency called ARPANET. It used a method of data transmission called packet switching, which Roberts, a member of the team, developed based on prior work of other computer scientists. ARPANET was the predecessor to the internet. A man with a dream that executed a plan and saw that dream come to fruition. You see, these folks, they didn't just have dreams, but within those dreams... They had goals. They had plans to see those dreams come to fruition. And over the last few weeks here at Rhythm City, we've been dreaming. We've been asking God, God, where are you leading us? Why does our church exist? Why do I exist? What's my purpose? What's my mission? God, what's the vision for our church? Where are you leading us? What does that look like for us as a church? And then individually, how do I find myself within that vision? And it's really good, it's really inspiring to dream big and think about where God could be leading us. But if there are no goals, if there's no plan, if there's no execution to a plan, then a dream is actually very weak. The children's book author, Catherine Patterson, says it so well. She says, a dream without a plan is just a wish. 
So over the last few weeks, we've discovered that dreams, vision of where God's leading us, when it's rooted and established and founded on a desperation for God, not just dreams and visions of, that are rooted and based off of and founded on our passions, our abilities, but a dream and a vision that's rooted and established and built on the power of God and him alone. That that dream can stretch your imagination. I mean, just as we read, you heard Kim read from Ephesians 3 this morning, how high and deep and wide and long is the love of Christ. And imagining as we sing that song, God's arms stretch wide for us. You begin to imagine and really stretch your imagination of just who God is and all that he is for us. But when a dream falls short is when there's no plan, no goal, no execution. See, dreams will stretch your imagination, but when you put in a plan, when you put in goals, those goals stretch you. A dream may stretch your imagination, but goals and a plan will stretch you to the point where you have to rely on God's strength. See, our hope for this series is not just to dream with you, alongside you, together, but my hope for this series is that it causes us to move. Is that it causes us to move together alongside each other. And over the last few weeks, maybe there's been some inspiration. Maybe there's been some hope put into you, I guess, by God's grace, by his providence, and, and the way that he loves you. It inspires us, even if we're in the pit, as we read from, from Gideon or even as we read the week before, in a place that we're absolutely desperate for God, we've discovered where the end of our rope is, and we need God. My hope would be that we wouldn't stay there, but that together as a church, you, as the church, we would move from here together. See, when God promised Moses and the Israelite people that they would inherit a promised land, they couldn't just stay where they were. They had to go. They had to go to this promised land. They had to fight the battles to take over the land that God had promised to them and given to them. They had to go. They had to move from where they were and go where God was leading them. And the beautiful thing is that God was leading them every step of the way. It wasn't this, okay, go and give me a call when, you, when you've taken over the promised land. It wasn't this, I want you to go and take the promised land and do it on your own. As we read in the story of Gideon last week, God actually was with them to such a degree that when it came to fight that specific battle against the Midianites and the Amalekites, God actually whittled down the Israelite army to 300 men against a numerous, vast army that, that was beyond the number of grains of sand on the shore. And he gave them the victory in that battle because it was on his strength and not their own. And today, God's calling us to move with goals, with a plan to execute when Jesus ascended into heaven and he leaves his disciples there, as we read two weeks ago, and we had some fun with this story in Acts chapter 1, where Jesus says, hey guys, here's the plan. Remember that place called Jerusalem where they killed me or tried to kill me? I couldn't stay dead, but yet, and then they wanted to kill you? Yeah, I want you to start there, Right? And then when you're done with Jerusalem, then I want you to go to Judea and Samaria. Remember those places? Those are the places where you actually hate them. So start with the place where they hate you, then go to the place where you hate them, and then I want you to go to places you've never even heard of, the ends of the world. And as soon as he says that, whoop, Jesus ascends into heaven, see you later. Like, if there's a time where we gotta rely on God, it's that moment, right? 
Because here's this decree and this, this command from God to go from this place. Carrying this dream that all of the world will be changed and reconciled back to God. And it's going to happen through you. But what does Jesus promise? He says, I'm sending you in the power of the Holy Spirit. So wait to go until the Spirit comes to you. Jesus gives them this dream. We're going to change the world. We're going to make disciples of all nations. We're going to baptize and teach people all over the world. Amazing dream. And then it comes to them to go, but they never go until they have the power of God. And so here we sit this morning with this dream that God's calling us to treat church differently than just a place where you show up on Sunday and more of this mobilized group of people to love this city. To literally not stay here, but to go. And he promises his spirit to us. And so if God is calling us to see a rippling movement of communities where everyday people like you and I follow Jesus together, if that's where he's calling us, then what's our plan? What's our plan to change our neighborhoods, to change this city, to change the world? What are our goals? What are we working for? Because if you and I leave here today with this dream of seeing this movement of rippling communities where lots of people are following Jesus together, but we walk out of here without knowing how can I act on that when I go home today? when I walk out of these doors today, then it's just a wish. But God's called us to a dream to step into, to move from this place. So what I'd like to do for the next few minutes is just share with you a few goals that, that we shared together as a church and what we long to see happen over the coming months and year. And as we talk about those goals, to also bring in some very tangible pieces that you can start stepping into right now, today. Without having to do anything else, you can simply begin to step more faithfully into where God's calling us through the values of our church. Let's start with these goals. Over this next year, we want to take strides towards these next five goals. And, and if you called Rhythm City or Church Home, I would invite you to write these down and, and just keep these in the back of your mind because together we carry this. Together we walk into where God's calling us. Together we set these goals to stride towards the vision, the dream that God's given us. And it starts with these goals. Number one is this, to become a self-sustaining church. To become a self-sustaining church. Rhythm City launched just about two years ago. In fact, next month we'll celebrate our second birthday. It'll be so fun to celebrate that with you. And right now, a little over half of our budget is covered by people who you don't see here this morning. People who, say, who said several years ago, I want to bless and support a church that's going to connect disconnected people. And still to this day, after giving a pledge to, to bless and financially support Rhythm City and prayerfully support Rhythm City, there are literally hundreds of people still giving to bless this ministry, to see it happen. But those pledges run up in a little bit. A goal of ours as a church should be to become a self-sustaining church. Why? Not so that we can just have more money in the plate, but so that we can make a bigger impact in our city. It's not about getting more money. It's about making more of an impact, making more of a difference. Ministry in this city matters. If you know the stories of your friends, if you know your story, then you know that ministry matters. And you know that there's, there's a void in your heart. There's a void in the hearts of people in our city that need to be met with something more than earthly relationships, 
materialistic things, 401ks, bigger and better houses or cars. But it needs to be met with the grace of Jesus. Ministry matters. And ministry takes money. Together as a church, we should have a goal to step into this, to become a self-sustaining church. Not so we can gain more money, but so that we can have more of an impact in this city. Number two, a goal for Rhythm City for this next year, and you just saw the fruition of it, to launch five new community groups in our city. As you will get to meet in the back and, and chat with them, hang out. Man, we can be here all afternoon if you want to just get to know the community group leaders. Uh, I guess I shouldn't have said that because I don't know if they can be here all afternoon. Uh, I should have asked them that first. But they'll be here for a little while. You can chat with them and get to know them. But we want to see more community groups continue to blossom. And over the next year, we'd love to see more than five continue to, to grow up. And, and what that means is that some of you are here this morning who aren't going to be leading a community group this fall, that you should be asking God, God, are you calling me to lead a community group? Because we believe that it's in the context of community that we grow in God's word, that we build relationships with other people and that we serve in our city. And it can't happen alone. Thank you, God, that we're launching five new community groups. And try not to cry. What a blessing it is of God to see that happen. To see God's spirit move in the lives of these community group leaders in such a way that they're responding to his call in their life. To see people through God's power, make a difference in this city. Number one, become a self-sustaining church. Number two, launch five new community groups. Number three, to see 70% of our church in community, in a community group. I'll just tell you right now, that's an insane goal. That's just, it's just nuts. Most churches, A, don't have groups to be a part of, and of the, of the churches that do have groups to be a part of, there's only a handful. And of the churches that do have groups, less than 30% of the church is actually plugged into a community group. So for us to say 70% of our church in a community group is a, is a goal that we have to be praying about because it's a goal that can only be attained by the power of God and his spirit moving in our church. But I don't want to be in any other place. If this is a goal that I can accomplish on my own, then we're aiming too low. We long to see 70% of our church connected in the community. Number four, we want to serve in our city 20 times between yesterday and next fall. 20 times. That's almost two times every month that we want to create an opportunity for, for you, for your community group, for our church to make a difference in this city. It started yesterday, that was number one. It continues this afternoon, number two, when we go to the church fair. And it'll continue in the fall as we continue to create opportunities for us to serve and make a difference in the city. Not just, not just preaching at people, but showing them what we actually believe in the way that we serve them. That the love of Christ is not meant to be reserved for a pulpit, but it's for everyday life to make a difference where people are at. And we're gonna do it together. We want to become a self-sustaining church. We want to launch new community groups. We want to see 70% of our church in a community group. We want, to see, we want to serve our city 20 times this year. And number five, we want to see new people come to faith in Jesus. The church has become really good at being inward focused and maintaining itself. God hasn't called this church to do that. God hasn't called us to maintain and take care of ourselves. While it's important and we want to love you, and I pray that we all love each other as a church in unity as God calls us to, we're here to make a difference in this city. And what good is a canned food at a food pantry or a gallon of water to someone who's thirsty if we don't meet their most eternal need? and salvation in Jesus. 
We want to meet people where they're at, serve them where they're at, meet their needs, love them where they're at, build relationships with them where they're at, but all with the purpose of introducing them to Jesus and letting his spirit move in their lives. So those are some goals, and, and maybe you kind of listen to those things, and you say, well, how do, we account, how, do I account, how do I find myself in that goal? How do I have a part in this? Well, these next five values that I'm going to give you, and then I'm going to shut up, and we'll be done, and the band will come up, and, and uh, we'll sing again. But these next five values are five values of our church that I want to introduce to you and share with you that I firmly believe that they're at least a starting point for you and your life. Regardless of what church you're a part of, I would pray that these five values might find a place in your home, in your family, in your relationships, in your own life. Not just be phrases that we slap up on a wall and say, this is what our church is about. But these are five values that help us understand and steer us in how we live our lives in such a way that we see our vision come to fruition. Where the dream is not just a wish, but it's actually coming to fulfillment because we're stepping into these, these five things. First one is this, and I think we have them on the screen for you to follow along. If you call Rhythm City Church your home, I encourage you, write these down. First one is this, follow Jesus over fit into religion. Because Jesus' way is better than American Christianity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, it says this. Paul says to the church in Corinth, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The church in America has distorted the message of the gospel so much so that people in America think the gospel is Jesus will make you a better person. That is not the gospel. The gospel, according to Jesus, not the American church, but according to Jesus, is that you were dead, and now because of him, you are now alive. Plain and simple. Gospel of American church Jesus will make you a better person. The true gospel in scripture is Jesus makes you not dead. And that is good news, church. We want to follow Jesus over fit into religion. Number two, we want God's word over our words because only his word leads to life transformation. Only his word, nothing else. No self-help book, no words of mine, no words of your community group leaders will lead to life transformation. Only the word of God will do it. Second Corinthians chapter four says this, for what we preach is not ourselves, Paul says, but we preach Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. We don't talk about ourselves, Paul says. We don't want you to know necessarily about what we think. We don't want to just be about giving advice because Jesus didn't come to make you better people. He, made, he came to make you not dead. And only his word can bring you to life. Only his word can transform us. And if every one of us would just press into that just a little bit more, if every one of us would think about following Jesus and not just fitting into religion a little bit more, if we would take a step every day to put this in front of ourselves and say, this is how I'm going to live my life, then the vision of becoming a rippling movement of communities where everyday people follow Jesus is no big thing. It's simple. It will just happen. Because as a community... We will follow Jesus over fit into religion. As a community, we will value God's word over our words. As a community, number three, we will go together over alone. In Acts chapter two, we hear of this incredible moment in the history of the church where Peter preaches this sermon and over 3,000 people come to faith. And then in the following verses, verse 42 through the end of the chapter, he tells us what happens and what the people do. And I know we're a little bit long on time, but we just, we have to press into this as a church. 
He says in Acts chapter 2, these people, these new believers, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The journey was never meant to be taken alone. And if I would simply believe that a little more today than I did yesterday, I'd be stepping towards the dream that God's put before me. Number four, as a church, we value being an everyday disciple over a Sunday morning pew sitter. Careful how you pronounce those words. Sunday morning pew sitter. You could get in trouble. Reason why is because church isn't meant to be just a place you go on, su- on Sunday, but it's this community, this moving, mobile community to love the city back to God, to reconcile it with Jesus. And the only way that happens is if we move from here, follow the dream that God's called us. And the most tangible way you can do that is to Day by day, hour by hour, ask the two very simple questions. What is it that God's teaching me? And how can I respond to him? In Mark 1, Jesus shows up on the scene. And after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. He said, the time has come. Now. Now is the time. The kingdom of God has come near. All of God, all of his blessings, all of his strength, all of his comfort, all of his guidance, all of his provision has come near, is at your disposal. Repent and believe the good news, Jesus says. Simply put, daily ask God, what is it you're teaching me and how can I respond? The fifth and final value is this. We long to be a community that serves others over serving ourselves. The reason why is because our world needs grace for right where they're at. And God has called you to be the one to bring it to them. Why is all this so important? Why do we spend time on this today? Not because religion tells us so. And if I can say something that's probably heretical, but hang in there with me. We don't even do this. We don't even take time to study these values or dig into scripture in this way because Jesus tells us to. We do this because Jesus himself did these things for us. We're not making up anything new. We're not saying follow Jesus over fit into religion because we're the first ones to think of it? Jesus did it. He's the one that flipped the religious world on its head. He came to forgive, not create more laws. We're not the ones to initiate this idea that we should value God's word over our own words. Jesus did it himself. He relied on the word of God even though he is God. If anybody didn't have to do that, Jesus would be the one, and yet he did all the time. He's quoting scripture and basing his life off of the words of his Father in heaven. We're not the ones to say together over alone. We just see what Jesus did, and we see that he came to redeem the world, and his plan was to invest in disciples who would invest in other disciples who would invest in other disciples to change the world. He didn't even do it alone. We're not the ones to say everyday disciple over Sunday morning pew sitter. We just see Jesus came to actually make a difference, not just listen to sermons and sing songs. We serve others instead of serving ourselves because Jesus, you can read this in Philippians chapter 2, Jesus 
in, being in very nature God, humbled himself and became a servant and became obedient, even obedient unto death. He came to serve, not be served. And church, we follow him because he did all of that for you. So we just need to take a moment and respond to God. Right where you're at. Why don't you take a moment. You can text in your prayer requests and we can pray for each other. We'll have the ushers come forward and collect our offering in just a moment. You can place your connection cards in there. But I really want to ask you to consider, based off of those five values that we just went through, what does it look like for you to just take a small step into one of those values today? Because my guess is, before your head hits the pillow tonight, you will have an opportunity to exercise at least one of those in how you serve somebody, in how you love somebody, in who you include or exclude, or how you have the option to isolate yourself instead of become part of community. You'll have an opportunity to listen to somebody else's words and value those more over God's words. Before you go to bed tonight, you're going to have an opportunity to exercise one of these. So take a moment, and as uh, the band plays this next song, they can come on up and... It's just a time for you to respond to God. So let me pray for us, and then we'll just enter into that time.